So with that, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Danny Bassett. Uh, she's an assistant professor of bioengineering here at Penn. Uh, she received her BS in physics from Penn State and her PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge in the UK. And she's got a ton of awards. Just to name a few, uh, she was named the American Psychological Association's Rising Star. She's an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, and a, she has a MacArthur Fellow Genius Grant. She also founded this really amazing program, the Penn Network Visualization Program, which is both an undergraduate art uh, internship and a K-12 educational program. Uh, so with that, uh, the title of her talk is Facebook, How It Relates to the Brain. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Danny Bassett. Great. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yep. Wonderful. All right, so tonight I'm going to tell you about how we can use Facebook to understand the brain. Um, and hopefully you're all wondering what in the world does Facebook have to do with the brain, right? Um, so on the left-hand side, Facebook is you know, clearly a... Um, it's a social networking software program that enables you to link with uh, friends that you know, uh, share information, share your ideas, your hopes, your dreams. Um, the brain is a met, wet, messy organ, right? So the two of these things don't naturally seem like they should really be going together in the same slide deck. Um, however, tonight I will be able to tell you why they do belong together. So number one, it turns out that they are both networks. So to understand what that means, I need to tell you what a network is, right? So a network is a very simple representation of complex data. Um, it separates complex data into two elements. The first is components of a system, which are called nodes here. And the second is connections between components, and those are called edges. So this pattern of nodes connected by edges is called a network. And that's exactly what underlies the similarity um, between these two ideas. So uh, let's sort of drill down a little bit farther in, into that. Um, how, does, how is Facebook a network? Well, Facebook is a network because individual people are the nodes, right? So those are the components of the, the, the Facebook system. And then the edges would be uh, links of friendship. So I link to somebody else because I'm their friend. And we say we're friends on Facebook. And so therefore, there's a link between us, OK? Um, what's neat about networks is that they have all kinds of interesting structure. Uh, very oftentimes, groups of individuals will cluster together in their friendships and may not necessarily link to another cluster of individuals. So I've put different types of uh, individuals that were at least um, familiar to me about 15 years ago. I don't know if they are still relevant. Um, but so there you go. There are clusters of individuals that sort of densely interconnect with each other. So that's how Facebook is a network. How is the brain a network? OK, so if you look at this, do you see a network? Do you see some nodes? Do you see some edges? Do you see a nice sort of ball and stick diagram? No. OK, good. Your eyes are working. All right, so what we want to do is we want to say, no, definitely not from the outside. You can't see that this is a network. But we want to put ourselves inside of this little girl and look through a telescope inside the brain and figure out what's going on inside. OK, so this is what's going on inside. So this is using a new type of neuroimaging technique called diffusion imaging. And what this does is it maps out the diffusion of water molecules inside of your head. So you probably didn't know that your head has a bunch of water molecules that are all bouncing around inside of it, right? I didn't really know that until a couple years ago either. Um, but what happens is that those water molecules bounce along. And as they bounce, they hit up against walls inside of your head. And the walls inside of your head are these big highways along which information can be transmitted. They're called white matter tracks. But they're basically information highways inside of your head. Um, so that's basically how this turns out to be a network. So how could we represent it in the ball and stick um, illustration that I had previously? Uh, We are missing um, significant pictures. <laughs> Let's try this. this is the way it's trying to. I really want you to see this, this figure. It's actually made by um, a student in the School of Design. So what we've been doing, he just came back from an um, uh, internship at Pixar. And what we've been doing is we've been combining movie making and neuroscience. It's really exciting. Anyway, so I want you to see it.
We can just go straight to the next one. If Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Great. All right. So this is how you would represent it as a network. So here you have little balls that indicate different parts of the brain. And then you have links between those balls that indicate these highways or connections in, uh, between different parts of the brain. Um, so the brain areas will be the nodes in our network. And then these highways or white matter tracks will be the edges in our network. Okay, so basically what we have is a twin problem. So we have Facebook, which is a network, and we have the brain, which is a network. And the question is, are there any techniques that we can use from the study of Facebook to understand the brain? So I put up here myself and my identical twin uh, to illustrate that it's a twin problem. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to treat these two as mathematically similar objects. Uh, these two, not those two. Um, and see what we can do. All right, so to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to pull from a new theory or a new sort of set of science called network science, which has been um, created basically to study social networks like Facebook. And this field is, is a, an academic field that studies complex networks, um, considering the connections between different nodes or components of a system. And basically, the idea is the pattern of nodes and edges really matters. There are different patterns that you see um, in different uh, systems, and that matters for how the, the system can perform. So it brings together lots of different fields. It brings together math in a, a specific area called graph theory. It brings together physics, statistical mechanics, computer science, statistics, and specifically sociology. So these, this was developed to understand networks like Facebook. Um, but because both the brain and Facebook are networks, we think that this should be very relevant for understanding how the brain works. All right, so in reality, OK, that was the pretty slide. And then this is the true slide, which is that network science is basically a lot of math, um, which is great for me because I love math. Um, but I jumbled them up because you're not supposed to understand any of it. That's fine. OK, so network science provides a toolbox for understanding the organization of these node and edge patterns. As I said, every system that we look at has a different set of nodes, a different set of edges, and a different pattern of interconnections between them. And so what we're trying to do is use math to understand what that organization is. What is the pattern? How can we describe the pattern? How can we predict the pattern? And then ultimately, how could we manipulate the pattern, um, potentially to change circuit behavior? So I'm going to give you two illustrations of how this can work to give you an intuition for why this mapping really matters for understanding the brain. Um, and the first is an illustration of a concept called network efficiency. So network efficiency is the idea that you want to transmit information from, from one side of the network to the other. And you would like to do that in the most efficient way possible. So on the left-hand side here, we have a network. And we want to get from this side to this side. The fastest way that we could do that is by going along the red lines. So one, two, three. That's the fastest way that we could get to the other side of the network. But you could also probably see a couple longer paths, right? So we could go. Um, along here, this would be a little bit longer. We could go around some circles and then go over, you know, if we're sort of feeling a little lazy. Um, so there are many longer paths that we could take, but the very shortest path from here to here is through these red lines. So that would indicate that we have a, a fairly short path length inside of this network. Similarly, over here, we have another network and we illustrate the shortest path. So different networks have different shortest paths. The networks that have the very shortest paths are most efficient in transmitting information from one side to the other, right? Because you can get information from here to here really quickly along, say, three hops. So the idea is, would that matter for a brain, right? So if a brain has sh a short number of hops, would that be better than if the brain had a longer number of hops? And the answer is yes. So there's a really interesting study by Lee and colleagues in PLOS Computational Biology. I didn't pull the actual data slide. I'm giving you sort of the conception. And if you want the, inform the uh, original information, you can look it up in the paper. Um, so basically what they show is they have 170 individuals. They calculate the network efficiency of that network architecture that I showed you, and then um, the IQ of the different individuals. And you could see that there was a strong positive correlation, meaning that people ha who have more efficient brains in terms of their network architecture have higher IQs. So that's really fascinating, right? It means that people have higher IQs who are potentially able to transmit information from one side of their network to the other really quickly with few hops. Um, so that's uh, one sort of comforting fact that suggests to us that the network idea is something that's relevant for how the brain actually works. Um, and let's give you an illustration of exactly why. So when information is transmitted inside of your brain, it's a little bit like these lines of, of light here. 
These are getting transmitted along those highways that I showed you, right? So if you're transmitting along the highways, and the highways are relatively short or relatively few, then you're going to be able to get information across the entire brain really quickly, right? Thank you to James Bartolozzi, who is the Pixar intern. All right, so then the next question I had was, um, OK, this is fantastic. Something about my network architecture could potentially predict how smart I am. On the other hand, I hate for somebody to say that there's something biological about me that tells me how smart I am. I sort of want to be bigger than that and better than that and be able to um, uh, potentially adapt to um, uh, my surroundings. So for that to happen, what I need to have is a relatively flexible brain, not just predicted deterministically from an underlying structure, but something that goes beyond that. So what I really want to know is whether we can look at the brain as a dynamic network, one that's constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly getting better, um, depending on what we give it, what sort of uh, uh, experience we, experiences we give it. So that was my next question. Uh, can networks change? So what we did to address that question is that we had individual sub, uh, humans, subjects, uh, um, students actually, come into an <laughs> they are, yeah. Uh, come into a, an MRI machine and practice a bunch of finger movements uh, very similar to playing piano arpeggios. And they practiced these over and over and over inside of an MRI machine. And as they were practicing, we captured images of their brains. So we could actually watch how their brains were changing while they were learning these little finger movements like piano pieces. So what we could do is we could take that information from the brain, from the MRI. Um, we could uh, section out different parts of that data and create a network architecture of which parts of the brain are communicating at that particular time. And then we watch over time as that communication pattern changes. So importantly, this is not just the underlying structure that I showed you about earlier, but it's which connections they're actually using. So you don't use all the connections in your brain at every single moment, right? You may just use a subset. And the question is, which ones are they using? So this technique gives us an indirect measurement of which connections they're actually using and how that changes as they're learning. So what we found is that everybody's brains changed as they learned. And that's comforting. Um, we would hope that that would happen. But we also found that there were huge individual differences. So some people, their brains changed massively, and then other people, their brains changed just a little bit. And we were curious, so what, what does that have to do with you know, how they're learning? So intuitively, you might imagine that people who are able to change their brain a lot are able to learn better. And then people who do, cannot change their brain very much might learn worse. And that's exactly what we found. So here you can see the network flexibility of the brain, so how much that network is changing over time um, and how much people are learning. And there was a positive correlation here, meaning that people who are more flexible in the patterns of connections in their brain that they're using are able to learn better than people who have more rigid brains. And these are the particular areas that are important in that. And specifically, they're areas that are important in um, difficult decision making, strategic planning, um, and, and higher order functions like learning. So these are the areas that really need to be flexible in order for you to learn. So I, saw, I thought, fantastic. At least now we have something that's a little bit more um, free. It's not completely deterministic. We have some amount of flexibility. This is changing constantly. And depending on our experiences and how we use our brain, we may be able to adapt and change. So then, of course, my question is, um, how do I become more flexible, right? Should I drink more coffee? I already do a lot of that. Um, maybe I should read some more classic literature. I did that a lot in high school and in college, and I've sort of like not done it very recently. Um, maybe I should eat more vegetables, like my mom always told me. Or maybe I should spend more time with my family. Um, and those are some of the questions that we're pursuing right now in my research lab, is to try to identify what is it, what sorts of experiences can we have that would enhance our flexibility. All right, but the bigger picture is the question of um, can we use these techniques, these sort of general techniques of looking at the brain as a network to really change the face of society? And we think the answer is yes in two different areas. One is in clinical care. So if we can identify who is flexible and how to enhance flexibility, then we could really have an impact on neurorehabilitation after stroke, for example. In addition, if we could enhance flexibility in children, um, then we may potentially be able to uh, affect educational outcomes in schools. Specifically, I'm very interested in the question of how you would create an environment for a child that would not just enhance behavioral outcomes, but would enhance neurophysiological changes that would occur in the kid um, to then enable future learning. 
And I think by combining educational theory and neuroscience, we're going to have a lot more power to impact um, childhood education in the future. So with that, um, I would love to take any questions. One, one thing we ask, if you have a question, please wait for a microphone to be passed to you for asking it. Thank you. Um, with the ball and stick model from the diffusion imaging and also during the arpeggio experiment, what are the nodes that you're using to make your model? Yeah, that's a great question. So they're individual brain regions. Um, so they're contiguous volumes. Um, of tissue, and most of them uh, directly relate to anatomical areas that are important for specific functions. So you could imagine um, V1, the visual cortex in the, in the back of your brain, would be one area of interest. Um, prefrontal cortex, which is a little piece in, in, the, in the sort of part way th towards the front of your brain, would be one area of interest. Motor cortex um, is actually separated into a bunch of different areas depending on which part of the body is, it's, it's controlling. Thanks. Um, so you kind of talked about diffusion imaging really quickly, and I was you like touch on. I was actually wondering a little bit more about how that worked. Does it like does it the water being used kind of translate to what area of the brain is being used? Just like with oxygen, fMRI. How no. Does that, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. No. So it, it really just is about the structure, the underlying structure. So water molecules will bounce around by Brownian motion. They'll hit up against white matter tracks, and by watching where they hit, you can reconstruct where the paths were. Um, but you can't tell which paths were used when. So you actually have to use something like functional MRI or EEG or MEG or another functional neuroimaging technique to see which pieces are used and when. Okay, so it can only be used in conjunction with something never by itself. If your question is understanding dynamics, you need to use something else, yeah. But if you're just interested in structure and there's a lot of interesting questions there, you can use just diffusion imaging. Thank you. Uh, um, I had a question. So thinking about... Um, Network efficiency and flexibility um, in can future tests. Can you wave your hand? Ah, Hi, good. hello. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah. The uh, light behind you, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm right okay. in front of this thing, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, my question was so you touched on network efficiency and flexibility. Yeah. Um, thinking about either development or even personality, is did you, for future testing, I'm sure you haven't tested this, but. Did you see any correlation or have you thought about any correlation between things that people do in development that relate to a higher either efficiency or um, flexibility later in life? Because I know you talked a little bit about education in the bigger picture as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so we're definitely looking at changes in brain uh, structure and function over development. So we're collaborating with um, Raquel and Ruben Gurr and Ted Satterthwaite in the Department of Psychiatry here at Penn. And um, so they have some really beautiful data in children ages 8 through 22. And so we are mapping out those changes. Um, but the question that you're asking is, is there something that we can do for one person and then watch how that impacts on their life, which is, which is a longitudinal study. Um, at the moment, we have not yet done that. Um, but I think that that would be really important. I think the work of um, Martha Farah here is particularly important in that, uh, in that vein because she works on the impact on, of socioeconomic status on uh, brain development. So I think that um, probably in future, you know, uh, putting the two lines of research together would be really fascinating. Yeah. Hi, my question is also in the education part. Has there been any findings that prove the effectiveness of brainwave entrainment or isochronic tones or binaural beats and stuff like that that improve cognitive functions in learning? Mm. So not that I know of, but I don't know that field particularly well. Um, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop questions for now, but feel free to stick around and ask the neuroscientists after we're going to get on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Bassett.